two, not one, but two of the U.S. Again? In three, two. Two GOP contenders for the presidency have admitted they didn't read the bill, the Obama Trade Act, but they voted for it anyway. And that knife-wielding terrorist up in Boston, him and his buddy had a plan to decapitate a policeman. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Those who uphold the law resist them. Welcome to the Voice of Resistance. Here's your host, Randall Terry. The Gospel of John talks a lot about light and darkness, people wanting their deeds hidden if they're doing something wrong, keeping it in the dark, and people not being ashamed or afraid if everything is out in the light. Well, just consider the Obama trade bill, as it's come to be known. Why the secrecy? You know that something is radically wrong when Barbara Boxer is agreeing with Rand Paul or with Jeff Sessions. Here's the problem. I, actually, I'm going to quote Senator Sessions because this is good, and then we'll quote Orrin Hatch, and you can see who's the hero or who's the villain in this. Senator Sessions said, any yet unseen global PACs, no matter how sweeping, are guaranteed a fast track to congressional adoption. No amendments, no ability to strike any offending provision, and no chance to apply either the 60 or 67 vote thresholds used for important legislation and treaties. We are creating another unelectable, unaccountable, unanswerable bureaucracy that can tie down and frustrate American sovereignty. Barbara Boxer said, the secrecy is ludicrous, it's ridiculous, and it's against the interests of the people we represent. Now, here comes the dark horse, the villain in this scenario, Orrin Hatch. Quote, in the midst of any high stakes negotiations, some level of confidentiality is essential to getting a good deal, especially in this case. Would you buy a car not knowing what you were getting? Would you do a real estate deal not knowing what you were getting? Or would you leave the people in charge of the dealership to pick the car for you? Look, we're gonna negotiate what car you're gonna get. We're gonna negotiate what terms. If you're gonna have a monthly payment, we're gonna negotiate the interest. You just have to trust us. That's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with, yet again, Obama and Republican elites like Orrin Hatch betraying government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now think about it. This is an 800-page bill. Most of the senators have not read the bill. Senator Rubio, presidential candidate, Senator Lindsey Graham, presidential candidate, they both admitted they didn't read the bill. They voted for it, but they didn't read it. God save us. We are again being betrayed, not just by the administration, but by Republicans, people like Orrin Hatch. What I want to know is what big money interest is behind this bill and why the secrecy? What is in this that's so critical that we, the people, do not have the right to know what it is that our representatives are voting for. They have the bill in, a, literally, in a secret room. People with proper security clearance, U.S. Senators and any of their staff that have the property security clearance, the proper security clearance can go in and study the bill. They can read the bill. 800 pages. So basically, bring your lunch, bring soda, because you're going to be there a while. Barbara Boxer mentioned that even when George Bush was president and they did some fast track legislation for trade deals with him, nothing was in secret. Nothing was in secret because people have a right to know what is going on. What Orrin Hatch is doing smacks of Nancy Pelosi. Remember with, with Obamacare? We have to vote for the bill so we can find out what is in the bill. 
I want to revisit, as we close out this segment, what we discussed yesterday. That poll from Fairleigh Dickinson University that said 29% of Americans believe that a shooting revolution is going to be necessary within the next few years to restore our liberties. I do not share that conviction and I certainly harbor no hope that it is true. But bills like this are what stir people up. Bills like this and the type of treachery and back door, backhanded secretive deals involving trade, this is what makes people say, we no longer have representative government. We have a tyrant in the White House, we have nine tyrants on the Supreme Court, and we live as the ruled, not as the rulers through representative government. I'm gonna take a break. When we come back, we'll visit the peaceful religion of Islam, both in Boston and in Holland. Don't go away. You have two choices. I mean, you can try to raise your children by design or you will raise them by default. There are no perfect parents. We're gonna get it wrong sometimes. If we have a plan, we've got a better chance of getting it right in the long run. There is something deep within the heart of every human being that longs for parental acceptance and approval. When does a boy become a man? Get a group of guys around and ask them that question. I don't think there's a certain age. Some men stay boys their whole life. I would say, uh, what? 16, 18 years old. Wow, that's a good question. When they get bar mitzvah? Well, I think when he has a child. So I just became at 56, yeah, 56 years old. Without the power of the Holy Spirit changing us and giving us power over our sin, we can't hope to be the dads that our kids need us to be. In the United States, the major media outlets have all but censored themselves and groveled at the feet of Sharia law, refusing to show the cartoon depictions of Mohammed. Now, as you know, in the news recently, those two terrorists were shot dead in Garland, Texas, as they rolled up guns blazing, trying to harm or kill people who were participating in the cartoon contest. Well, just before the shooting happened, a Dutch parliamentarian, Gert Wilders, had finished speaking and then had to leave to catch a plane. He's the head of the Freedom Party in Holland. They hold 12 seats. Out of 150 seat legislature, their party holds 12 seats. So, it's, if anything, it's the tail that wags the dog. They clearly don't have a lot of political power yet. His agenda is clear and fearless, namely, don't let any more Muslims in the country. Let's talk about deporting the ones that are here. Let's say, he says publicly, no more mosques. Do not let any more mosques be built. Now, two things about that as we look through the grid of American liberty. Number one, most Americans cannot conceive of saying you cannot build a house of worship, no matter what the religion is. But he has connected the dots. He recognizes that a mosque is basically an embassy of a foreign government. It's a foreign law code. Sharia law is a foreign law code. And their allegiance is ultimately to Sharia law, to the Quran, and to the Ummah, one people, one Islamic people. Gert Wilders gets it. He gets it. And he's come to the place, having lived with police protection for nearly 10 years, he's come to the place where he says, look, I have nothing to lose except my life. They're, they have a, a, a multiple fatwas against this guy. They want him dead. And so, holding his life cheap as it is, he's saying the truth. He's saying things that a lot of people want to say but don't have the courage to say. He's saying things that a lot of people want to hear but very few people are hearing them. Well, or saying them to be heard, rather. He's ratcheted it up. This is almost comical. Recently, they tried to show some of the cartoons in the Dutch parliament, and the parliament canceled the art exhibit. They literally said, we are not gonna let you show these pictures here. Not to be outdone, not to be told no. He said, okay, 
I'll show them on television. Evidently, in Holland, there is a law that the TV stations are required to run a certain amount of minutes per month or per year, I don't know. But he, he as a leader of his party, is going to be able to co-opt television stations and require them, by law, under Dutch law, to show the cartoon depictions of Mohammed. Come full circle back to the New York Times, to the Washington Post, to Fox, to CNN, and think with me, with the exception of the Washington Post showing one cartoon, one, this one, the one with the turban and the bomb in the turban. With that exception, the New York Times, the LA Times, the three major networks, even our beloved Fox bowed the knee to, to Islam, to Sharia law, submitted to their fears. So when you, when you think of Pamela Geller or you think of Gert Wilders and you think, well, man, they're just provoking. They're just, they're just trying to pick a fight. Ask yourself, if you submit to this point on Sharia law, what's the next one you'll submit to? I mean, where will this end? And I want to point out one mistake, if I may, in the Breitbart story. And I, folks, you've got to focus on this and you can use what I'm about to tell you to correct people when you hear it misspoken. The story opens this. Wilder said that he would show the cartoons during television airtime reserved for political parties in a move likely to offend Muslims since Islamic tradition holds that any physical depiction of the Prophet Muhammad is blasphemous. That's not true. That is not true. Showing depictions of Muhammad is against ongoing Islamic tradition. There are Muslims who do it. It's frowned upon because Muhammad said he didn't want any images of anything. It wasn't that there couldn't be an image of him. He wanted no images of human beings, no images of angels, certainly never an image of God, and no images of animals. The only things that Muslims are allowed to draw are images of plants. And that's why so much of Arabic art is, is geometric patterns, arabisks they're sometimes called, or the calligraphy of, of, of Arabic, the language. Because any art expression has to come through that uh, means not through what we in Western art would talk about as portraits or carvings. They're not allowed to do it. The issue is not that it's blasphemy to depict Muhammad. The issue is it is a capital offense punishable by death to mock Muhammad. That's it. If somebody did an art exhibit that showed Muhammad being embraced by the angel Gabriel, or someone did an art exhibit showing Muhammad with Ali and Fatima in a family setting with their grandchildren, with Muhammad's grandchildren, they're not going to be sentenced to death. They're just not. It's because he is being mocked. And Muhammad, once he got the reins of power in his hand, one by one, he had people assassinated, killed in their bed, who mocked him. Do you want to get America out of the hands of wicked and unjust men and women who are destroying the republic before our eyes? and put leadership back into the hands of righteous men and women so that we don't die as a nation? Well, you're talking about social revolution and there are rules in social revolution. We can look at the victorious social revolutions of the past, such as the end of slavery, the end of child labor, women's voting rights, the end of segregation, and so much more, and learn from their victories. Look at their actions, their images, their rhetoric, their sacrifices, and their final fruit. We will send you this series that originally cost $129, seven books for students, one teacher's guide, if you'll give a gift of any size and just pay for shipping and handling. 
Take advantage of it today. Usama Rahim, killed by a Boston police officer and an FBI officer who both shot on him at the same time. He was killed because they had been following him for some time and decided, you know what, we need to question him. So in broad daylight, they walked up to him and said, we'd like to ask you some questions. He pulled out this knife that you can see on the screen and came at them. They said, put down the knife, put down the knife. He kept coming at them and they pulled out their revolvers and they killed him. Well, it turns out that the reports are true. He was involved in a plot to not only kill, but to behead at least one Boston police officer. Thank God they used deadly force. Thank God he's dead. But here's where the plot thickens just a little bit. His brother, Ibrahim, is a, quote, respected imam at a mosque, at a mosque in Boston. In one of our earlier segments, I discussed with you that we need to view a mosque as, a, as an embassy of a foreign government or a foreign law. It's not simply a house of worship. It's a place where people are taught the principles and the history of not only Sharia law, but the Hadith, the Sunnah, Muhammad's deeds, Muhammad's actions. They learn how to become a good Muslim. Is any thinking person going to tell me that the man that was shot dead, who obviously went often to his brother's mosque, that he didn't get some of his inspiration from his brother at the mosque? This begs two questions. Number one, profiling. When's the last time that a terrorist attack in America originated from a Methodist church? When's the last time a terrorist attack originated from a Catholic church, a Baptist church? I don't know of any, okay? But we do know that mosque after mosque in America is connected with terrorist attacks both in America and abroad. So profiling good, not profiling stupid, okay? The FBI does not have any reason to have informants inside of the local Methodist or Catholic church, but they have really good reason to have informants inside of the local mosque. So here's my, here's my uh, last point before we have to take a break. We're running out of time here. We need to stop with the politically correct nonsense that says everyone is the same. All religions are the same. We have nothing to fear from Islam. It's ludicrous on its face. Okay. It's ludicrous on its face. The Boston bombing that happened, what, going on two years now, those two young men were, our FBI was warned by the Soviet intelligence and it said that these guys have been hanging out with so-called radicals. You need to keep an eye on them. The FBI did not do that. They ignored the warning from the Russians. So meanwhile, the FBI and the NSA, they're involved in this massive sweeping gathering of, of data of, on all Americans rather than using their time and effort to look into people like the brothers in Boston or into these brothers. So, Randall, are you saying that you think that there should be informants in every mosque? Well, yeah, I am. I am. Because there are imams in America and around the world who are deliberately ignoring certain parts of Islam. Namely, they're not encouraging people to kill infidels or to kill those who have mocked Muhammad, but we don't know who they are. And a lot of these mosques are having sermons preached in Arabic. So we need to have people that are learning Arabic, people that can understand what's being said, and people that are following what various imams are saying and what the chat rooms are saying online. Because, <laughs> I'll close with this, I, I ask your forgiveness for being trite. At the end of the day, Jesus died to start Christianity. And if you want to mimic him, you have to be willing to lay down your life. And at the end of the day, Muhammad killed to start Islam. And if you want to be like him, you want to mimic him, well, then you're going to view killing infidels as one of your options.
I'll be right back. I have been a leader in the pro-life movement for 30 years, and sadly we have not prevailed in our goal to make it a criminal act to kill an unborn baby. There's reasons why we have failed. I wrote this book, a humble plea, to Catholic bishops, to evangelical clergy, and to lay people explaining where we went wrong and what we have to do to prevail. We've made this available as a PDF online for free. I encourage you to go and download your own copy. Why does a nice guy like me keep getting thrown in jail? I have been arrested almost 50 times and spent over a year of my life locked up in various prison facilities. And I wrote a book, many books. In fact, one of them is called, Why Does a Nice Guy Like Me Keep Getting Thrown in Jail? It's a theological work, answering those who say that the church should not be involved in politics or that we should retreat. I encourage you to get it. In fact, get one and give it to your pastor. Merciless Indian savages. That's what Thomas Jefferson called the Indians in the Declaration of Independence. He talked about King George III actually recruiting and stirring up Indians to fight against the white man, against European settlers. So the truth of the matter is that there were some times in the conflicts over decades and almost centuries really where, where white men and Native Americans did fight and the Indians did kill women and children, capture them, hold them for ransom. And I know that the white men did some pretty brutal things to the Indians, okay? So if you're an Indian and you see a group of white men coming and you run, at that point, are you being a racist? If you're a white man and you see a group of Indians coming and you run, are you being a racist? Or are you just using common sense? Do you know enough of the history of the conflict that you say, you know, I probably don't want to be here at this point. Or if you're a Jew in Nazi Germany in 1939, after Kristallnacht, after they had smashed up all the, German, or the Jewish businesses, and you see a, a Nazi coming towards you with a Nazi uniform, at that point, are you being a racist? Are you being a bigot? Well, you say that all Nazis are the same. Are you being unethical, unjust? in your fear and your desire to slip out of the room and get away as quickly as possible? Or are you just being prudent because of the facts on the table? When we discuss Islam, when we discuss mosques, when we discuss so-called terrorism, when we discuss Pamela Geller in the cartoons and, we, and this guy that they just shot with a knife in Boston, it is not unjust, it is not unethical, and it is not xenophobia or Islamophobia, as some of our well-meaning people in the media want to call it. It's none of those things to say there's a problem, and the problem may be inherent to Islam. If you're a regular viewer of this show, you know that we are in the middle of doing a new 14-part series called What Would Mohammed Do? That series will focus on the life and times of the founder of Islam, Muhammad. We will look at what he did, what he said, and what he permitted to happen in his presence. That is the foundation for Sharia law. It's the foundation, unfortunately, for a lot of acts that we in the West would call acts of terrorism. But in the mind of devout Muslims are simply an act of devotion to Allah as they continue to spread the faith and to suppress infidels and to suppress heresy and error, which those of us who are not Muslims are involved with. So I close with this thought. If you are looking at someone who just might want to kill you, you're not being unjust, you're not being a bigot, you're not being a racist to be a little bit alarmed.